maraming salamat Pastor Mar. Uh, palabiro yan at um, huwag kayong magtaka uh, dahil kayang-kaya akong biruin yan kaya ganun. Anyway, um, I'd like to greet uh, us all here this morning. Since nandito tayo sa Northern Luzon sa gitna ng Ilocanja, no? So, I'd like to greet you in Ilocano. Uh, I, I love this um, sentence because this is the only sentence that I know in Bicolal, uh, Ilocano, I'm sorry. Nabingga na... na Help me, help me. Help. Naimbag. Naimbag, naimbag. Boy, I'm sorry. Nagsisimula pa lang tayo na wala. I know it's here. Eh. So, Tagalog na lang. Magandang umaga po sa ating lahat. Paki-check ito. Okay. Meron pala akong ito eh. So, okay. Sorry. Well, um, I, I'd like to start with a um, an explanation now. Kasi uh, yesterday at least one or two asked me, O bakit nandito kayo? Akala namin ay, ay hindi kayo akyat ng bagyo. Uh, sa totoo lang, wala kaming balak umakyat sa bagyo ngayon. Uh, but uh, last week I received a um, text from Pastor Odi. Uh, he was asking me kung pwede daw ako mag, mag-preside sa ordination kahapon, no? So, um, well, wala po tayong magawa. Um, nare-request tayo. Wala namang dahilan kung bakit uh, tanggihan, no? So, we came and then uh, alongside sabi rin Pastor Ode, maybe you can also um, speak ngayon, last day. So, um, I know somebody has to give way. So, Pastor Rex, thank you very much. I saw your name over there. Thank you, Rin. Yeah. Uh, alam ko, naunawaan ako ni Pastor Rex. Eh. Uh, nakakatanda kasi ko sa kanya. Although, uh, halos, halos, hindi naman ganyang kalayuan. No? Kasi, okay. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Rex. No. I appreciate also the uh, message kahapon, yesterday. By, by the way, Pastor Wong, please, uh, uh, please allow me to from time to time, slip into Tagalog because when I get carried away, like Pastor Mario, he was uh, talking about you in Tagalog. So, I don't know if you understood much of what he said, but he, in, in plain language, he said, he's very happy you're here. And we're happy for you to be here. Imagine 30 years na pala sila since the first time they came here. 30 years, so it's a, well, it's a wonderful, you know, wonderful um, time to renew memories, no? And uh, we're together, Pastor Wong and uh, his wife in Rayong, just a few weeks ago, no? Last month, I think. August, and uh, we had a good time with the Rayong brethren, okay? Um, I don't know if I've forgotten anything else that I should say before I talk. But anyway, um, when I was asked to um, speak today, and uh, I know there's a, uh, there's a theme, abide, you know. Well, it was quite a challenge because, you know, oftentimes when I speak, I like to speak from the heart and whatever it is that, uh, you know, is there already. And uh, to be asked to speak with a theme is quite a challenge. So, medyo nagkandarapa po tayo to really implore the divine providence, you know, and um, seek out his uh, mind on what perhaps we should be hearing in connection with the term abide or with the theme abide. So, in line with the theme of the festival, I thought I'd like to speak on the incarnation. Now, I know it's a big subject, but um, don't worry, I'll, I'll simplify it. Uh, don't be intimidated by theological terms. But basically, incarnation refers to God dwelling initially with us. Um, this was uh, pointed to by Pastor Wong yesterday. John 1.14 is a very, you know, it's a something maybe to reflect upon every now and then. God came in the flesh, Emmanuel. 
according to the Message Bible, God resided in the neighborhood. You know, He's just nearby. He's in the neighborhood. No, but there's another side to the incarnation, and that was this was also pointed out uh, too by uh, Pastor Wong yesterday when he referred to uh, 1 Corinthians 3:16, uh, where it says, "You are the temple of the living, living God." Now, I, I'd like us to focus on those two verses as perhaps the, the text for the message, although I'll not elaborate and not do an exposition of these two passages, but maybe just make a commentary about what really is the incarnation as far as we are concerned. Perhaps the greatest story that can ever be told in the entire universe is the story of the incarnation. God coming down to us in the flesh. I was really struck and I was happy to, you know, um, listen to the songs early this morning. Wow. I said, this is a validation to what perhaps, um, um, you know, we might be hearing. So that's fantastic. That's why Christmas is always something that we look forward to because it reminds us of the coming down in the flesh of Jesus Christ, the second person of the Trinity. But next to that, the other side of the incarnation, I would say, is that God not just came down in the flesh, but He, he came to dwell in us. You know, uh, according to scholars, and I have a little bit of a knowledge of Greek, you know, just a little bit, and whenever I don't know any more about the other things about Greek, everything becomes Greek to me, you know. I think it's to my Anyway, uh, according to scholars, the, the term temple in the New Testament used for us as um, the one being mentioned as the temple of the Holy Spirit or the temple of God, it's actually speaking of the Holy of Holies, not the overall temple structure, but the Holy of Holies. Could you imagine that? The Holy of Holies has now been deposited in us. And as Paul said in Ephesians, let Christ dwell in your hearts at, um, richly, you know, richly. Okay? So, and if you also connect that with Matthew 13, uh, the parable of the sower, which is actually the, uh, if you don't know, according to Jesus anyway, he said, if you don't know the parable of the sower, how can you know about the rest of the parables that he's talking about in Matthew 13? So, the per, that first parable contains the password, actually, the code to understanding the rest of the parables. But anyway, the code there is the heart, the soil. And Jesus Christ, the Word, has been planted in your hearts. Do you realize that? So that's another way of saying the Holy of Holies has been planted or deposited in your very hearts. Now, if God dwells with us or abides in us, I'd like to use the term uh, used as a theme, what should it mean to us as followers? By the way, oh, oh, good, good. You know, you have to, pardon me, I, I, when, I, when I speak, I get carried away. I forget the other things that I need to do. I have a clicker here, no? Okay. Does it work? It doesn't. I was instructed to point my clicker over there. Oh, there you are. Not yet. So maybe you can just help me out, Galeno. Okay. So if, if God dwells or abides in us, what should it mean to us as followers? I'm sure a lot of you will have answers which are correct, different answers. But um, I'd like to just focus on one of these many answers. And by the way, each of those answers, I believe, could, could be made into a great sermon. So this is a fantastic topic, perhaps in all the Bible. God dwelling in us, God coming down, Emmanuel, you know. I think Pastor Wong pointed this out yesterday quite thoroughly, you know. He did an exposition of the entire Bible, you know. Fantastic, from to cover to cover, you know. At least, we know that from Genesis to Revelation. Okay, so this is the thing I'd like to point out. If there's one thing that you'd like to take note of, of this whole message, it is going to be this. God, through Jesus, has decided in eternity past to dwell with us and in us 
so that, listen to this, He, God, can enter into an intimate, experiential relationship with every one of us. It's quite lengthy, parang mahaba, pero the point is, God desires to enter into an intimate, experiential relationship with us. Okay, um, I, I'll have a few more things to say on that. The uh, first thing that I like to say is, you know, and I'm not saying this on my own, uh, I've, I've come across this one uh, from um, another writing of a scholar. Okay, thank you. Okay. Abide, okay. I will abide in you. Napindot, okay. Ano kaya ko ikaw na lang magpindot? <laughs> Hindi naman sa ako ay ano, IT, ano tawag dyan? IT. Hindi naman deficient. Ikaw naman ako. <laughs> IT challenge. Okay, thank you. I have to just look at Rex to provide me with some millennial answers. Ano? <laughs> Do you know that we are also part of the millennial group? Yeah. Except that we had the prefix pre Millennial, we belong to the. <laughs> now, according to this uh, Christian author, scholar, he said, If I may define God, God is relationship. Wow. Think about that. God is relationship. Now, of course, I know most of us would say, if we are asked, Who is God? What is God? God is love. Okay, that's correct. But love cannot take place in the vacuum. It's got to be acted upon or acted on. That's why I say, in addition to the statement, God is love, I say, but love is a verb. Love is a verb. God is relationship, and relationship requires at least two or three to complete the relationship or for the relationship to take place. That's why God is community. God is trinity. God is relationship. God is love. And love is a verb. You know, that's why uh, I think the Trinity is pictured to be in a perichoretic. You know, it's a dynamic motion, something like you know, circular. You know, uh, of course, our our words are so limited to describe what God is. What I like to say is, love needs an object, or perhaps you can say subject. Love needs a subject. You know, there's a verse in Proverbs I think which says. Um, Open rebuke is better than secret love. You know why? It's pointless, useless if you have a secret love and it's not uh, coming out. Better to have an open rebuke. At least somebody is benefiting from the interaction, from the relationship. But if it's just secret, you know, once I had a secret love, you know. <laughs> I don't want to sing this out because uh, na-expose tayo kung anong generation natin eh. I, I'm, I, I feel sometimes that when I talk about songs and lyrics, mukhang I get cut off from the millennials. And I don't want to get cut off, no? Otherwise, there's going to be no relationship, no? So we need to maintain the relationship. Yeah? So God created us so we can be actually subjects or objects of His divine love or divine relationship. You now, come to think of it, maybe you'll be <laughs> uneasy uh, to say the least. If I say this, do you know that God needs us? You know, there was a song one, one few years ago, You Needed Me. I had difficulty singing that song because, you know, as it's actually referring to God. But you see, that's true. God needs us. And I'll show you um, in a short while that it's true. Don't be shocked at that. God needs you. God needs you. It doesn't mean, of course, that God cannot exist without you, without us. But God needs us. You're so special to Him. Now, we'll, we'll see about that in a short while. But, okay, I'd like to refer to Athanasius and um, um, Irenaeus. Irenaeus first. Okay, now, thank you. Irenaeus, uh, around 800, uh, 800, 180 AD, says this. By the way, Irenaeus and Athanasius were two of the early church fathers who had spoken a lot about the Incarnation. No? 
There are a few others, but these are the ones most quoted too uh, nowadays. No? The Word of God was made man, and he who was the Son of God became the Son of Man, so that man, you and I, having been taken into the Word and receiving the adoption. Now, adoption today is not a strong word, but not so in the early days. Not so in the Roman world, you know. Adoption is even much more powerful than actual, you know, uh, what they call that, legitimate uh, birth, you know. Uh, receiving the adoption, son of God. Okay. Good. If someone wishes to see God, malakas naman masyado, no? I'm not shouting at you, no? Blame them, you know. If someone wishes to see God, who is invisible by nature and in no way visible. Jesus Christ said, no man has ever seen God. And I suppose we'll never see God. I don't know. I don't know. He's invisible. He understands and knows him from his works. So he, so he who does not see Christ with his mind, let him learn from him from the works of his body. You know, our bodies are very important. Take care of your bodies. Don't take for granted your bodies. They're very, very important. It's part of the, you know, process of the incarnation. And through the incarnation of the Word, remember John 1, 14, God Himself having been made known. So God is being made known to us through the incarnation. Do you realize that? He became man that we might become divine. Don't stumble at that statement. Uh, the better way to maybe express it, it is so that we, according to Peter, can become partakers of the divine nature. Okay? We will not have the substance of God, as God is God, but we'll have the nature of God, partakers of the divine nature of God. And he revealed himself through a body. You know, one other thing that I'd like us to realize is that God wants to reveal himself. He always wants to reveal. No? Uh, please don't forget that. And he revealed himself through a body that we might receive the idea of the invisible father. How do we know God exists? How do we know God is compassionate? It's through the experience we have with a person called Jesus. And later on, it's through the experience we have with the persons like you and me. Okay? It's really mind-boggling. Uh, if, if you think about it. Donald Pear Barn, who is the author of the book Life in the Trinity, I've been recommending this because this is a very easy book to understand. Uh, he's an easy, uh, he's an author, it's an easy reading author. He said, our love for one another is meant to be a mirror of the love of Christ has shown us. If one asks what the heart of the Christian faith is, what's really the bottom line of it all? If one will ask, what is the heart of the Christian faith? The answer is that, uh, part of the answer is that a life reflecting the love of Jesus or the love Jesus has shown for us lies close to, the, to, to that heart. So it's mirroring Jesus, you know, the love of Jesus. Where do you see it? In a body. In a body. See, you don't see God. You can't see God right now. But you see that God in a body, as that body reflects the very life and the very love of Jesus Christ. Now, I'll share with you three verses in the Old Testament, which will show us how much God loves us, you know. Now, uh, before I forget, now about the cross. Um, I, I was thinking, wondering, how come it's not the Father who died for us? Where the rain, right? Why the sun? Why the sun? Now, it's a reflection of a pseudo-theologian, so please forgive me. Why not the Father, but the Son? Care to have an answer? Well, my answer is this. It's not, you know, I'm not a theologian. I'm not claiming to be one, but it's something that you can reflect on. You know, God has to show how much He's willing to go beyond what he can do to show us that he loves us. There's no greater love that he has 
or object or subject that he loves, but the Son. And he is willing to let go of the Son in order to reach us and to love us. How far more do you expect uh, God to do to demonstrate his love for you? While we were, we were yet sinners, God already demonstrated his love for you. By, by what? By Christ dying for you. You know, John 3.16, oftentimes I think it's read from an anthropocentric standpoint. But it's theocentric standpoint. God so loved the world. Understand God. God so loved the world. And there's the verb. So that's why he gave his only begotten son. That's the verb. He gave. So he's willing to go beyond what is beyond. There's nothing greater than the son. And he's willing to give it up for you, for me. Wow. Think about that. Reflect on that. Dwell on that and never let it go. Because that's the very essence and the bottom line of your love is. God is love. But that love is proven by the fact that he's willing to let go of anything, of anything that is most beloved to him in order to reach you and me. That's powerful. In Isaiah 43 verse 4 it says, Since you are precious in my sight, have you ever thought you're precious in God's sight? Speak to yourself. You're precious. He said, I, therefore, oh no, since you're precious in my sight, I have loved you. You know, in, in many of our retreats, the thing that really moves people and get, gets them transformed is when they hear from the Lord that they are loved. Sometimes there is a variation to that. They hear, you are my prince, princess. You know, you are my whatever adjective that you can have. And they cry their hearts out because they be, it become, God becomes personal to them. It's fantastic and it's a blessing to be, you know, uh, um, what, um, a witness to these uh, experiences that people have. Love is the most powerful, uh, uh, we can't call it a thing, love is the most powerful power in the entire universe. I have loved you, therefore, I will give men for you and people for your life. Think about that again. There had been a lot of sacrifices made since the beginning of time up to now for you and for me. Have you ever thought of that? The prophets, the missionaries, all other persons who have dedicated their commitments to the Lord have died for your sake. But don't forget Jesus Christ is the preeminent a human being to die for you or the person that God has given for your life. It says here, Isaiah 43 verse 3 or verse 4. Yes, another verse, Jeremiah 31 verse 3. I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, with loving kindness, I have drawn you. God keeps on drawing us back, attracting us, calling us, you know, sometimes whispering to us, Whatever it takes. But God has been drawing you. Did you realize that? The reason why you are here is because God has drawn you. The reason I am here is because God has drawn me. Even before the time I came to be aware that there is a God. Or that there is a personal God. I draw, drew them with the cords of a man. With bonds of love. See? Whatever God uses, it's a band of love. You can bet your Bottom dollar, if I may use the expression, on that. You can bet your life on that. God draws you with bands of love. Never different. God is consistent all the way through. Um, and I was to them as they who take off the yoke, yoke on their jaws. Now this is, um, uh, you know, the, the reference here is about uh, people uh, in captivity who are, um, you know, uh, held captive or kept in control by putting some instruments to, you know, it's like the handcuff. Instead, ginagamit sa Diyos ba? It's really cruel, no? But uh, God delivers us from all those, you know, um, slavery in whatever form. And I laid meat on them. That's Revelation. 
chapter 3, where it talks about, I stand at the door and knock, and I will serve you. I'll give you meat, you know. It's fantastic when you begin to think of what God will do just so He can pursue you in a loving relationship. You know, listen to this. Yes, God has wired us for love. The re- very reason why you exist is for love. For love. It's, it's a fantastic thing. When I came to realize it, it's, it's really mind-boggling. You know, I can just stop here and pause and just, you know, digest on that statement. God has wired us for love. You exist for love. The very reason of your being is for love. And God wired you for relationship because love is relationship. You cannot survive without relationship. That has been proven true by science. Babies who have not been touched at all, sooner or later they die. Because human beings need to connect. You can't live in isolation. You know, our God is a God of community. How else can we be? But be a community. Transformation takes place in a community. Oh, you know, I've been wondering about us keeping what we call festival. We have detached it from, you know, some religious uh, connections, you know. Sometimes I think you, you find it difficult, you know, what, what are we doing here? It's a festival. Oh, a festival, why? Okay. Nowadays, at least, uh, you know, sometimes I, I really scratch my head because nowadays a lot of Christians are actually keeping the Feast of Tabernacles. And they even go to, the, to Jerusalem to just keep, celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles. This year, last, I think a few weeks ago, they celebrated Feast of Tabernacles in Luneta. Big crowd of people, and, uh, no, I'm sorry, ultra. Big crowd of people celebrating Feast of Tabernacles. No, I, I thought about that. You know, Feast of Tabernacles, have you ever connected that to what John 1.14 is saying? Christ tabernacled with us. And today, God has deposited the Holy of Holies in your hearts. Think about that. Think about that. We were created for, to worship God. Worship is relationship. You know, worship is predicated on love. We worship what we love. Think about that again. We worship what we love. Again, I'm reminded of the old song. I will not sing because, you know, you might leave the place before my song is over. But uh, I think the song goes this way. What did I say uh, last uh, about the song? I uh, worship and adore. You remember the song? Uh, Adele, Pastor Adele. You are the one that I worship and adore. Climb, fly me to the moon. Fly me to the moon. You know, um, sometimes we kind of hesitate to use the word worship. But you know, I, 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 don't have, uh, I don't have problem with that anymore. Worship is basically adoration, you know, giving a person the credit that belongs to him. There's a different way, of, uh, there's a different worship we, we allocate for God, but we worship also something that we love. No? But uh, if, if you're uncomfortable with it, don't follow me. You know, that's for me only. Number two, if love were to remain and grow, there has to be a continuing response. I've, I've sensed this. I've heard this earlier in the song. There's got to be a response. For a relationship to exist and to continue, there's got to be a response. That response is a love response. Okay? There cannot be any other response but love to love. Love begets love. Love uh, responding to love. And in love, you know. You know why people who are in love blossom? As they say, you know. Mukhang nagbo-blossom ka. Aura mo. You must be in love. Wow. Because love begets love. If somebody admires you, there is an almost automatic response. You also admire. Maybe not the one that admires you, you know, sometimes. But at least you feel you're admired, you know, right? Somebody admires me. You know, there's a song way, way back where the... Wag naman, hindi pa gano'ng kalayuan to. Okay. Na talagang naawa ako dahil yung father ang kumakanta eh. Yung anak niyang babae, hangang-hanga doon sa lalaki ba? 
Pero yung lalaki ay dinededma yung babae. But yung father, sa, yung father ang kumakantay, sabi ng father, kung pwede lang itong lalaki ito, dadalhin ko sa uh, anak ko. I was imagining, what if I have a daughter like that? What would I do? What would I do? You know, I know some of you fathers who have daughters, one of your main concern is, makakapag-asawa ba kayo itong anak ko? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, let's be honest about it. Yeah. And maybe that's one of the blessing na meron ako. Wala akong anak na babae. It would be my war and concern. Yeah, because I'd like to see my daughter get married. Yeah. That's normal. That's normal. So there's got to be a response. Perhaps this is the reason why God is describing the Bible to be constantly calling, come, 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 you know. God keeps on calling you, come, come to me. Okay. Perhaps, ah, okay, God draws us to himself. We've heard that earlier. He attracts us, and listen to this, oftentimes, God uses people and circumstances to do just that. Did you realize that? God sometimes uses people and circumstances to just do that to you, to draw us, to draw you to himself. This was what happened to the first followers of Jesus. Andrew brought Peter to Jesus. Philip brought Nathaniel to Jesus. The Samaritan woman brought the entire community to Jesus. Love here, giving birth to love. You know, I don't believe anymore so much in te- teaching people about evangelistic um, methodology. I don't, I, you know, I'm sorry to say this, you know, but that, that's me. You know, you don't have to follow me. But, you see, if you're in love with Jesus, you don't need evangelistic methodology. You'll talk about him freely and openly. That's what happened to the Samaritan woman. She was hiding, running away from the entire community because she was marginalized. She was looked down upon. But look at this. When she encountered Jesus, she fell in love with Jesus. The resulting effect was for her to forget about anything and everything and go to the very group and persons that despised her and told them, about Jesus. And that was an effective evangelism. Effective evangelism. You know, uh, uh, there was a time when I was reading this uh, Samaritan account and suddenly I felt so touched by this story because I could feel the, the emotion of the Samaritan woman. No? The Samaritan woman was looking for something. She was looking, she was looking for that something at least in five men already, but she could not find it. And I think the people around her would judge her and condemn her to be an immoral woman. Maybe yes, uh, from the standpoint of people. But we, before Jesus Christ, she was a beautiful woman. Jesus Christ went to her and never talked about her past, except that uh, he told him, yeah, because, uh, the one that you are having uh, at this time is not your husband because they were not yet married. Maybe she was in the process of getting divorced. Okay, I don't know. I don't know the culture of that time. But anyway, and somebody pointed out to me, you know, Jesus Christ was the seventh man in the life of that Samaritan woman. But that's, yeah, something, you know, like uh, a, a bulb that was not lighted, uh, lighted up, you know. The seventh guy to come across the path of Jesus and, you know, that seventh guy provided the very thing that the Samaritan woman needed. You know, God looks at the heart more than the actuations. That's what happened to the prodigal son. The father never cared about the past, never cared about, you know, whether he was able to utter the words of repentance. It didn't matter to him what is important was, come on, you know. And told the, uh, the, the household helps to provide everything that the prodigal son needed. Anyway, so when one is in love, attracted to somebody, it would seem that the normal response is to draw others to the subject or object one is attracted to. That's what happened to the Samaritan woman. But there's another thing that maybe you need to think about. God does not only call people to come. He visits and initiates an encounter. He starts a conversation. Maybe he has been trying to start a conversation with you, but you're not paying attention. 
Uh, examples of this again, the Samaritan woman. Jesus Christ was the one who initiated the conversation or the dialogue. The man lying beside the pool of Bethesda, you know, Jesus Christ initiated and asked the question, do you want to be healed? How about the blind person? As Jesus was passing by, that's the introduction to that incident. And you know what happened? The disciples started talking about him. I think Jesus Christ was initiating a conversation with the disciples alongside with the blind person. But the point is, it was Jesus Christ who initiated the dialogue. He can easily bypass this, the blind person or any one of us. But he would like to start always a dialogue with us. What about Zacchaeus? You know, it was Jesus Christ who looked up and called Zacchaeus, come on down, you know, like the price is right. Come on down, Zacchaeus. I've got a price for you, you know. 100 or bucks, you know. Well, anyway. Somebody said, God walks on this earth incognito. I've got a stanza for you. I have tweaked this a little bit from Elizabeth Barrett Browning. I, I encountered her when I was in high school, never thinking that I'll be able to mention her name again. You know, She said, and I, I tweaked this a little bit, All of earth is crammed with heaven, and every bush aflame with fire. Those who see, take off their shoes and worship the rest Sit down and pick the berries. I don't know which category do you belong to what uh, this author is saying. I hope you're the one who discern the presence of God. God walks on earth incognito, but all of earth is crammed with heaven. As Pastor Wong was saying yesterday, heaven is not just a place. It is a condition. It is a, the presence of God is what is heaven for us. One author said, um, Heaven is present within you. Oh, yeah, that's true. Because God's presence is in you. Now, lastly, if love were to remain or to abide, meaning if we are to abide in our relationship with Jesus, we also need to watch that it doesn't grow cold or worse, it dies out. Now, please don't get me wrong. You might misunderstand me. I'm not talking about salvation here. It's a different thing. I'm talking about the love relationship. Okay? Two references, and I don't have time to read. Revelation 2 verse 4. Speaking to the Ephesian church, Jesus Christ said, I have somewhat one thing, something against you. You have lost your first love. Wow. There was a second love, of course, if there was a first love. It simply means that the attention of the Ephesian church was diverted from Jesus to something else. Isn't it true? In our relationship, a lot of things distract us from the main thing that we are supposed to focus on. Now, very, very, what? Uh, pakiramdam ko eh, nakakatakot na question to. It's a fearsome question to us. Yung pag-ibig mo ba sa akin ay nandyan pa? O lumamig na? O nawala na? Have you ever asked somebody that question? Meron pa ba? Now, I know you are quiet because I think it struck a chord in each and everyone's heart. Mahal mo ba ako? Meron pa bang natitira dyan? Totoo ba yan? Please raise your hands kung totoo. Uh, you, you don't want to commit yourself, but I know deep within each and every one of us, we ask that question. Mahal pa rin niya ba ako? Nakalimutan ko na ba yung nakakalimutan ko? When you look at these passages in the context of love relationship, and by the way, the other passage is John 10.10. 10, very powerful verse. Now, it can be a text for one powerful sermon. It says, The thief comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. But I have come to give you life, and life that is abundant. Now, there is a contrast here. The thief and Jesus. Now, oftentimes I think we tend to be anthropocentric when we read these verses. Read these verses from the standpoint of Jesus. He's talking about the life that he's giving you, but that life can be stolen, killed, or destroyed. He's talking about love. <coughs> Excuse me. He's talking about love relationship. Love relationship 
can be stolen from you, can be killed, and can be destroyed. It doesn't mean you're cut off from God because God will never cut himself off from you. Never. You can bet your bottom dollar uh, on it. Because God says, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. Never, not a second at all. He's always there beside you, in front of you, behind you, and on top of you, below you. But it's us who can cut ourselves off from him. John 10.10, 10, it's a powerful verse. What's stolen is the life, not your material possessions. As a matter of fact, sometimes maybe God will test you to give away all your material possessions. But that is not the thief taking away your life. The thief takes away the relationship, the abundant life that you can have with Jesus. Okay, I think I'm finished. Could you imagine that I'm finished? Do you believe it? I'm finished. You know, But I'd like to practice the discipline of silence and reflection with you. I still have about seven or eight more minutes. I'm very particular with time because I was instructed. <laughs> Stick to your time. I think it's because I've got a record. I, I don't know. No, no, no. Why are you laughing? No? But this, you know. I could have ended the message 10 minutes ago or even 15 minutes ago. I, I would have done already justice to the message. But anyway, I'd like to practice this silence and reflection, contemplation time with you. I'm just wondering, many of you have had exposure to the Odyssey in Christ ministry, right? I just would like to request with your permission, please raise your hands if one way or another you have come across or encountered or sat in the presence of Odyssey in Christ ministry event. Wow. Maybe almost uh, a third or close to one half. Yeah. We enjoyed it, right, Mr. and Mrs. Pastor and Mrs. Wang, no? We enjoyed it. I was so moved and touched in that retreat, really. Um, you know, I, I thought about it this morning. I, I realized I had always been practicing the silence and solitude discipline long, long time ago, even when I was still young. Because uh, I was the silent type. <laughs> Always alone, you know, in solitude. So I practice ko na pala ito. But, so I think most of you have experienced this. So I'd like you to practice this. And I'm posting on, in front of you three questions. And if you want to take note, okay, while, before we start. First one is, how's the state of your relationship with Jesus at this time? You know, I've, I've asked that question early this morning while I was praying, reflecting, you know. I'm going to ask this question of the church. I should ask this uh, to me as well. What's my state of relationship with Jesus, you know? It's amazing what you'll find out. Number two is, what's Jesus telling you about your present state of relationship with him? Do you hear him calling you? Do you? Do you? The third one is, What's your response to what Jesus is telling you about your personal relationship with him? I, I was struck by what Pastor Mario said. Because this was also the thought I had in mind this morning. We are on a mountaintop experience here. You are in a sense in Mount Carmel like Elijah, Mount Sinai like Moses. You are encountering Jesus here as a corporate group, as a corporate body. But down below, as Pastor Mario said, is the valley of the shadow of death. I wonder if it's a prophetic statement. I don't want to believe Pastor Mario is a prophet. But I think he was trying to prophesy. Oh, where's Pastor Mario? Yeah. No, I can't read people's heart. Not yet, anyway. But um, I, I seem to sense that he's trying to give us a warning. Down below, and it's true, down below in the valley, you will encounter shadows of death, trials and challenges and difficulties. But remember, the Lord is always with you. Jesus will, uh, the Father has never withheld anything back to provide you. Nothing has He withheld from you. 
so that you can journey with Him and continue on with the journey. It's not the end goal that counts with God. God is not after the end goal. There's no end goal, by the way. Have you ever thought that? God is after the continuing relationship and He will bring you to wherever He wants to bring you. There's no end to it because it's for all eternity. For all eternity. What's, what are you going to do together? Relationship. That's what the Trinity is all about. Okay, so these are the three questions. I'd like you to close your eyes, please. Okay. You'll have to, to discipline closing your eyes. If you don't want to, that's fine with me. No problem. I'm not requiring you to. But if you want to take advantage or make the most out of the time remaining, uh, close your eyes and just uh, reflect on the questions. They are not easy to uh, forget. Okay. And then I'll, I'll close our time together reflecting these questions uh, with a short prayer. In the silence of the heart you speak And your mercy is the air I breathe You come to me with spares and forgiveness is In the silence of the heart you speak Lord you speak To the quiet of this room you come I am captivated by this love You light these darkened corners And I'm overcome To the quiet of this room you come may want to conclude your uh, silence and uh, contemplation with God with a sentence or two of prayer response. And if you will all please rise, I'd like to pray, pray a blessing for you. Almighty Father, you brought us here to experience a mountaintop experience with Jesus. I believe, Lord, that you have spoken to each and every one of us. Special personal message for each one that we can carry home as our takeaways. Lord, please nurture, bless, and make that seed, additional seed that you have planted in our hearts, 
which is the place where you reside, the Holy of Holies in our lives. Make that seed continue to grow. Grow in nothing else but in love, in relationship with you. Lord, empower us by the presence and through the enabling of the Holy Spirit to be able to respond. Respond as you initiate a conversation and a dialogue with us. Help us to have a heart that's open, broken, and spilled out. Open and vulnerable to you. So that we can truly enjoy that good life, that abundant life that Jesus Christ was talking about. I pray that you will put a shield, shield around each and every one of these people who are here to listen to your voice, to respond to your call. Put a shield around them so that the lives that you have planted in their individual hearts will not be taken away from them, stolen, killed, or destroyed. Instead, Father, I pray that that life will grow towards becoming more and more a reflection of the very person of Jesus and by so doing, glorify you. Yes, Father, may you get glory from us as Jesus Christ is reflected in us through the very love that Jesus has for each and every one of us. May that love flow out from us like rivers of living water. Uh, others may drink of that rivers of living water coming out from the very innermost beings of our very own hearts. In Jesus Christ, I pray this prayer. Amen.